In my youth, I lived in Western Michigan, not too far from Lake Michigan, and in a deeply rural town. Fewer than 2,000 people reside in my hometown, and I live some 20 minutes away from civilization. While there are few people, there were miles of rolling farmland and untamed forests that surrounded us, giving my father ample room to indulge his favorite hobby of hunting. One year, it was nearing Christmas, and we were no longer in school. My father was begrudgingly taking time from work to be with the family, and all was well. I remember on a particular night, it was rather bright out, and sometime after dinner, our dogs began acting strangely. We had a basset hound and a lab mix at the time, and both began circling the outermost edges of our home, occasionally whining. At first we thought it was a bit odd, but still charming seeing them gazing out the window, one a head taller than the other. After a couple of hours though, the behavior went from cute to concerning. My mom and dad debated calling a vet, but eventually ruled that it could wait until the morning and got settled for bed. My father, the avid hunter, was excited to see if there was maybe a stray animal outside and took his rifle with him when he took the dogs outside to use the bathroom. I remember hearing some commotion but I was honestly too engrossed in whatever video game I was playing at the time to care. Eventually, my father returned with our lab mix, Millie, but our basset, Walter, was nowhere to be found. Well, this wasn't too unusual. The dogs had plenty of space to roam out there and would sometimes run off for hours. However, their earlier behavior seemed to trouble my dad. My father indicated that Millie had never left his side, but Walter just bolted. My mother and father tried calling for our missing dog, but to no avail, and eventually started getting ready for bed. It wasn't too cold yet, so they figured he'd turn up sometime. Millie, however, became increasingly nervous. The paths she walked early in the day, she continued to patrol, though now she quickly crossed from window to window, as if trying to see everything at once. She wouldn't stop, and eventually my parents put her in their room, and we parted ways for the night. My room faced the dirt drive that eventually met with the road, and, as such, our porch was outside it. There were large windows in my room and thick drapes that managed to keep the porch light out. Yet you could see if something, usually bugs, passed underneath the lights. So I settled into bed, and I remember hearing strange sounds, some howling out in the distance that reminded me of the yowling noises coyotes would make, which is still pretty standard for Michigan nights. However, Millie began making this awful whining noise. It was so loud that I could hear it from my parents' bedroom on the other side of the house. Even though she eventually went silent, I went to check up on her and my parents, now worried for my dog. I don't remember what we talked about, but some time passed in my parents' room and my mother led me back to bed. I was watching the ground 
very nearly asleep while my mom prattled about this or that until she suddenly stopped. Her hand gripped my shoulder tightly and I looked up to ask her what was wrong. But she just kept staring at my window. Through the thick drapes, you could see a figure standing on our porch. It seemed to be trying to hide itself tucked in the corner of the porch. Yet its silhouette was plain for us to see. For a moment, it just stood there until it seemed to lurch forward from a standing position to a crawl as it moved out of the window's borders. I began to speak, but my mother hushed me with a finger to her mouth. She dragged me back to my parents' room. She told my father that something was outside my room. Initially, my father smiled as if we were playing a prank on him, but immediately sensed how serious she was. He nodded and went for the door. He told her to call 911, but only if something happened, as he was just going to check. Then he quickly left the room and my mom and I stood there. She finally let go of me and patted my pockets, hunting for her phone, but realized she had left it in the kitchen. I was really young and didn't know what to do. So I just stood there in the center of my parents' room, waiting. You could hear my father slowly making his way through the house and the creak of what I assumed to be the gun cabinet opening. After what felt like ages, he finally returned, slowly opening the door. He came back and said he hadn't seen anything. Just before a booming, shaking sound filled the house. It sounded like something was trying to rip open our front door. These loud and irregular beating sounds filled the room and my mom took me towards the floor with her. My father began to shout, I have a gun. This is private property. But the banging didn't stop it seemed to get almost more frequent. My mom was shaken while she held me. My father told my mother to call the cops, but she admitted with panic in her voice that she had left the phone in the kitchen. My father cursed and flung open the door. Our home was an open floor plan so I could see the front door from my parents' room. There was a large figure standing on the other side of the glass, its massive bulk nearly filling the entire upper window on the door. Our firewood stove was near the front door, so the light from it in our eyes and the porch light behind it helped keep the figure in darkness. My father marched towards the door and raised his gun while my mother suddenly ran into the kitchen and got her phone. I stood there alone in the room. I heard my mother frantically calling 911 while my dad approached the door and eventually fired. Even through the bashing at the front door and the shrill cries of my mother, the gunshot echoed in the house. There was a loud groaning noise from the other side of the door, and then the figure quickly left. I stood there frozen, just watching the whole scene unfold. My father yelled to my mother to get into the basement and wait for the cops to get there while keeping his eyes on the front door. I 
heard my mother giving our address and saw her walk towards me. She grabbed me by the elbow and looked past me towards the back of the bedroom and the window. I remember her screaming in my ear and dragging me towards the basement. I never got to see what it was that made her scream. As we raced down the stairs, my mother shakily finished her conversation with the operator. She told the operator there were bears outside and requested that they send help as the bears were trying to get in. I remember my mother and I huddled in a corner and my father, upon reaching the basement, kept a trained eye and his rifle pointed at the door to the basement. The rest seems like a blur. I remember sitting there with my family for quite some time until eventually the police came. They spoke with my mother and father and my father walked with them outside. I wasn't allowed to go with them out of the house. But the next day I remember seeing the damage to the front door. There were long gash marks all across the wood and it seemed to be bowed in a strange way. My father thinks we were lucky. The heat from the wood stove near the front door had warped the frame of the door so much over time that we hadn't been able to open it in years. We always used the back door. The police agreed that something that determined probably would have made its way inside had it not been for the extra support. They never found anything outside that night. They made comments about strange markings in the ground, but snow started to fall. I remember walking around the house the next day our family friends were there seeing the damage. I only heard snippets of the conversation between my parents and their friends. Bear was brought up frequently, though no one could agree. Walter, our basset hound, was considered missing for a couple weeks. Eventually, our family friends found him. I was told he had drowned, but they wouldn't say anything else on the matter. To this day, I don't know what really happened. I asked my mother about the event years later and only got a grim smile and some deflecting conversation. I know she would rather put everything behind us and pretend it could never happen again. Sometimes I wish I could too.